Uh, so many thanks for the invitation. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't come to Spain uh, because I got a cold. Um, yeah, daycare viruses are going around meanwhile. Um, but good to the COVID pandemic, we have now the hybrid option. I can give a presentation virtually. So um, I was asked to talk about geodetic GAA modeling. Um, and I thought a bit of a while about what I'm going to really talk about because it's it's a really wide uh, topic. Um, and it all comes back because um, I work at La Madrid and we do a lot of geodetic GAA modeling. For those uh, who haven't heard what La Madrid is, it's a Swedish Mapping, Cadastro and Land Registration Authority. Um, those who are a bit more familiar with the German system, it's basically BKG plus all the uh, 16 provinces of the Cadastro and Land Registration Authorities. Uh, La Madrid exists since almost 400 years and we have more than 2,000 employees and about 50 people work at the Department of Geodetic Infrastructures where also where I work. Um, we are in charge of the positioning system, sweepers, um, the leveling, and then we also send out a few of these sweeper stations to the European or global uh, GNSS networks. We also do gravity measurements, and we are also involved in the Bifrost project with uh, co calculating uh, velocities, GNSS velocities. Um, I will come in a minute why this is important and why Land Madrid is so important in this topic. Um, Land Madrid is also part of NKG, which is the Nordic Geodetic Commission. Um, Nordic Geodetic Commission now involves these countries shown in red, so it's Sweden, Norway, Finland and Denmark and Iceland, and meanwhile also the Baltic states are part of NKG. Uh, NKG is a cooperation by researchers in geodesy within the Nordic countries. Um, it includes researchers from national mapping authorities like Land Madrid, but also universities and research institutes. Most work is done within the working groups, as shown here. These are quite similar to IAG, so it's um, it's a regional IAG, I would call it, NKG. Um, these working groups also meet annually, and then they have a general assembly of NKG every four years. Um, everybody who is working in the Nordic countries is encouraged to join one of these working groups. Um, and everybody with interest in work that is done in the Nordic countries is also in, uh, welcome to join meetings of the working groups. Um, it, the important aspect of NKG is that we address topics that are of common interest for the Nordic countries. And this is, for example, glacial aesthetic adjustment. Uh, Richard named GAA or glacial aesthetic adjustment already in his uh, talk about IAG. Um, for those who haven't really heard the term yet or don't know really what glacial aesthetic adjustment or GA is, it's a response of the solid earth to uh, changes in the ice mass. Um, to explain it in short, so we have an ice sheet that is uh, depressing the earth's surface, leading to a change in sea level, so it's attracting sea because we have more mass here. Um, it's even taking mass out of the sea because we are building an ice sheet. Um, when we melt the ice sheets and shown by the dotted line or dashed line, we get a rebound signal and then we also get a change in this new sea level. Um, this deformation does not only affect the lithosphere or upper Earth's surface, it goes down to the Earth's uh, to the core mantle boundary. So even the mantle is responding to this with, uh, melting ice sheets. And when we melt the entire ice sheet and shown on the bottom right, we have ongoing rebound. We have a bulge collapsing because of the mantle affected by this uh, process. And of course, then also a new, new sea surface. Um, my two previous speakers already mentioned a bit um, where GA could play a role in, ge in geodesy. Um, when I was preparing my talk, I was also looking at the presentations that were given last year to Chico Days in Munich. And there was a presentation by Martin Howard about the ice sheet's contribution to sea level rise. And the interesting aspect is that he had the, mentioned at the last slide in the conclusions um, major uncertainties that play a role in estimating these ice sheet contributions. And he mentioned the three core elements of genetic data acquisition analysis and also parts of GIGOS. And also he mentioned 
really GIA because this is a really important aspect for all these three up here because usually what these three uh, disciplines do to take a model of GA and correct for it. Um, and you will see in my talk that this isn't maybe always that such a good um, thing to do. Um, before I talk about GIA models, I would like to mention a bit uh, about GIA observations. So we have several types of observations. One are paleo observations from the logical side. Um, these are relative sea level. They tell us something about the past, um, and they are quite reliable, the data. So we ha can have different type of relative sea level curves, depending on where we are. And for example, in uh, Sweden, where we had an ice sheet, uh, lying exactly on top. We have an, um, basically only in, uh, land is uplifting, so sea level is falling, and this is also seen by this uh, picture up here in the upper right. We see these former beaches going higher and higher, and then we can date these beaches, and then we know where the beach was at what time, and so we can get one of these curves. Um, if we go to an area which is along the margin of the ice sheet. Uh, for example, in Scotland, we have this curve. We have also first a sea level four, so uh, land is rising. But at some point, we uh, come into the four bite region and then um, we get an uh, increase in sea level and now it's again falling. In the far field, for example, in Sealand, in the Netherlands, but also for locations uh, close to the equator, we get a sea level rise over the entire time since uh, the last 20, uh, 12,000 years. Um, of course, we also have uh, geodetic observations. They tell us, for example, the 3D land motion, something about what is happening today, how it, does, how it looks today, the GAA process. Um, for example, for Northern Europe, we have the uplift center shown by the orange reddish color and close to uh, or between Sweden and, and Finland. And uh, yes, this is well-known phenomena, we, not well-known map we, um, that shows uplift. We can also show the uh, horizontals shown by these uh, black arrows pointing away from this uplift center. Um, for North America, we can produce a similar map, only vertical velocities shown here. Uh, we have maximum uplift shown by the red color in around the Hudson Bay in Canada, and the four bulge, the peripheral bulge is collapsing uh, almost exactly along the Canadian-US borders, shown by the blue dots, uh, uh, which are related to subsidence. And even present day, co presently covered ice uh, areas with ice sheets, uh, we see a vertical uplift in most regions. Um, this is because the ice sheet was a bit larger, about 20,000 years ago, on this melting in, in the past is now shown by the uh, rising of the land in these areas. Um, then we have also gravity changes which show something or tell us something about how the Earth is behaving in the future, how, um, how mantle material is moving back. There we have um, observations from the satellite gravity data, for example, from Grace and Grace follow on. These show examples for Northern Europe and North America on the right. Um, red shows a positive signal and blue a negative signal. And these are just the pure results from some grays. And uh, what we see is that the mass is coming towards the satellite. So that's why we have a positive uh, anomaly. If we also look at cavity changes obtained from ground-based stations, for example, from absolute cavity, but also, for example, from SG data. Um, we get a negative uh, anomaly, and this is because we have the station on the ground, and the ground is moving away from the uh, Earth center because of the land uplift. But the um, location and type of the anomaly is quite similar to what we observe um, from the satellite cavity data. Um, these are our three main observation types. So something about the past, uh, what we see today, and what about ha is happening in the future. And then we have many helpful constraints coming from geodesy, but also from geology and seismology. And for example, Earth rotation parameters are an important aspect that uh, is used in the models, as well as more recent uh, 
sea level, relative sea level changes as obtained from altimetry data or tight gauges. And at the end, we want to have a model that this can describe all of these observations so that we can provide a correction for these observations again and uh, that we can also look into the future. Um, why do we need a GIA model in geodesy? So my, the two speakers before me already showed a few examples where a GIA model, model could be useful to be applied. Um, I have two examples. The first example is uh, again showing the grace signal, the grace trend in millimeter per year. And here we can take a GA model output now and correct the grace trend for the GA model. And then we get a difference. And this difference we can uh, understand further for looking into mass changes in the atmosphere, ocean, hydrosphere, ice sheets, or solid Earth without GA. Um, some take the grace trend to look at the GA signal, so it's always a balance act of where to go if it's a signal or if it's noise. And um, GA can be also used as an additional constraint when we go for um, uh, national realizations of uh, reference frames. So if we go, for example, from the ITRF reference frame towards a national realization, we use GA models and at two steps in our uh, transformations. Um, I'm staying now for a few slides in the NKG area that I showed you before and showing you two examples where um, work in NKG area was uh, supported by different countries within NKG. Um, so this is the first example is an NKG 2016 land uplift model, which was uh, compiled by Olaf Vestel from Norway and Kartwerket. But um, this was not, was not only work by Norway, it was supported by work from Finland and then Sweden and other countries. Um, they used a, a GNSS station and leveling data to get an empirical model based on these observations, showing the vertical signal that uh, is quite common to what we have seen before. And then they want to interpolate and extrapolate um, this signal to the rest of the area. And here comes a GA model into, uh, into the game. Um, they also took now a GA model, a best fitting GA model based on GNSS and relative serial data and took this out from the empirical model to get a really small signal that has um, a really small mean value. And this is wished because we, in our interpolation or extrapolation, we don't want to have any remaining signals that we know in the observations. So they removed the GA model from the observations, interpolated it, and then put the GA model back in and got as a final result, the final land uplift model as shown here. It looks quite similar to the input GA model, but if we look, for example, going back to the GA model, this uplift uh, center here, this anomaly is a bit different to the one from the empirical model. And when we look at the final land uplift model, they are more common and uh, fit much better to each other. So in that case, uh, the GA model was used as a correction model, and so we, it, was a, it was a noise again. Um, staying in the NKG area for the development of the NKG RF17 well model, the horizontal velocity model, uh, a GA model was used as well. So here showing the horizontal velocity vectors uh, pointing away from this uplift center around here. And again, we want to interpolate and extrapolate using a least squares collocation. And this interpolation requires some input parameter, and these are obtained via a coherence analysis. And already in this step, there was a need to use a GA model. So this shows the results of the coherence analysis um, using no GA model and doing a separate analysis for each horizontal genus S component. So we show the coherence on the y axis and then uh, over the distance on the x axis. And we estimated the empirical coherences in specific distance groups. And what you see is you have a large standard deviation of these empirical coherences. Um, and in addition, the curve fitted to these uh, empirical coherences is not really uh, well constrained. And we cannot really be confident in our um, 
correlation length that we get there. And this applies to the east-west as well as to the north-south component. So in the first step, we use the combined analysis of both horizontal genes as components. And what, is, what we see is that we decrease the uh, standard deviation, which is now much smaller. You, you cannot really see it anymore. But the fit to the curve is still not really good, and we ha have to work on this further. So in the next step, we reduced um, the GA, reduced the GAA model from the observations and did the same analysis. And this is what we obtained now. So standard deviations are again quite small, but now we have obtained a curve that fits to the empirical coherences, and we can be more confident in our um, analysis. I'm showing these two at the same time, without reducing the GA model on the left and reducing the GA model on the right side, um, you see that the correlation length doesn't really change. It's only two kilometers. It's nothing. But we are more confident in our value we obtained. Before, we could um, obt have obtained almost any other correlation length for, from the covariance analysis. But now we have a curve that fits quite well to observations. And now these values were then used in the estimation of the NKG RF, uh, RF17 well model. Um, I mentioned a lot about the GAA model. Uh, so now coming to this part. So what is a GAA model? A GAA model um, is, uses an ice and ocean loading model as well as an earth structure and rheology. And this part depends quite a lot of parameters. Mantle viscosity, lithosphere thickness, rheological parameters, and the rheological model. And when we put these two together in the GA model, we obtain outputs as listed here. The problem is that um, if you apply an ice and ocean loading on the GA model, this uh, obtained solid earth deformation, again, influences how the ice and ocean loading should be distributed. So we have to iterate over it. In addition, we have observations that I showed you before, and we can compare our output to the observations and then adjust also our ice and ocean loading and earth structure and rheology. So we see there as quite a lot of variance in what we can do and how we can come to a best fit GA model. So this brings us to uncertainties in GA model. Um, when we just look, for example, at the observed present day uplift rate from GNSS data, we cannot say anything about if we had a small ice loss at 5,000 years or a large ice loss, ice loss at 10,000 years. We cannot say it by just using this observation. Similar, we, we don't know if we have a small ice loss and a strong earth or a large ice loss and a weak earth. But if you look at these curves, you would say if you have a really long time series, at some point you would be able to understand. That's why we also use always several observational constraints when defining our GA models. Another aspect is um, that the Earth is unfortunately not 1D. It's a, it's a three-dimensional Earth. We have many variations in lithospheric thickness and mantle viscosities. And these also affect our estimations. So this shows an example from Grace Need for Antarctica. The 1D uplift rate versus a 3D uplift rate, where a 3D mantle viscosity and lithospheric structure is used. And the differences are not Legit bill. So they're quite a, quite large. And so it's important to consider uh, the 3D information from the Earth. And another aspect is uh, compressible and incompressible Earth models. And I will focus on this for the rest of my talk now. Um, now looking at the vertical velocities using a compressible and an incompressible model. What does it mean? In a compressible model, um, the density is allowed to change when we compress. And this is how it should be, because the Earth is not fluid. Only the outer core is a fluid, and there we can assume we have inco incompressible material. But if you are under lithosphere and mantle, and this is where GA is uh, doing something to the Earth, then we have um, we, sh we should definitely use a compressible model. And this shows now an example using ICE model I6G and the corresponding Earth model, VM5A, using the GA code ICE age. And for the vertical velocities, looking now at the differences between these two, because they, they actually look quite similar, but looking at the differences, you see that they are, can be up to 0.8 millimeter per year um, in both directions. And this is not really small. And if you consider that we have some uncertainties in GNSS observations, um, 
marking now white, all these that are in a range of uncertainties. Um, we see that North America and Northern Europe, you could sense um, if you are using a compressible or incompressible model. If you look at a different rheology, a weaker Earth model, um, the response is much faster and you almost see no uh, uplift left in these areas. And also the differences are then uh, not existent anymore based on the uncertainty level of GNSS observations. For the, so for the vertical velocities, it's still um, okay in most areas to use an incompressible model that is used in most cases. But uh, if you go towards areas where we had maximum ice thicknesses, it's definitely necessary to go towards a compressible model. Um, it's a bit different for the horizontal velocities. And there it's already known that these are way more depending on not only the 3D structure of the Earth, but also on if you're using compressible or incompressible models. So again, showing now the right using the same ICE model, Earth model, and the GIA code. And you already see from these two uh, figures in the top that there is a difference between compressible and incompressible. And taking the differences between these two, they can be up to two, plus minus two millimeters per year. And this is a lot. And uh, considering that uh, GNSS uncertainties are much smaller for the horizontals, um, we are now left with quite a lot of areas um, where we could uh, see a difference between what type of model we use. And then interestingly is that this area we have the largest differences of more than minus one millimeter per year is where we have a lot of stations along the Canadian US border in the peripheral budge. So when you're taking these stations and want to correct for a GA model, then it's definitely necessary to know what type of model you're using. And um, the problem is that if you're using a different Earth structure, because the horizontal velocities are quite sensitive to the Earth structure as well, you get a vice versa result. And then it's plus one millimeter per year difference between these two approaches. Um, going one step further and looking for Greenland and trying to find the best GA model, only comparing to GNSS observations. Um, but using a compressible model or an incompressible model setup. And what we see is that we get um, uh, different best fit models. While the lithospheric thickness uh, differs by 20 kilometers, the upper mantle viscosity is the same, but in the lower mantle viscosity, again, we see a, a small discrepancies between the best fit models. Um, these differences are actually not that big, so um, it's, it's still, doesn't really matter if you use a compressible or incompressible model, but let's look at the result of the best fit model uh, as shown here for Greenland. And what you see is that the vertical land uplift shown by the color bar and red showing positive values is different between the, the two best fit models, compressible on the left, incompressible on the right. Um, and especially in South uh, Eastern Greenland, we have this uh, interesting area, which is also studied quite a lot by many GNSS stations, many work on it, also when it comes to a possible Iceland uh, hotspot movement beneath Greenland, we see quite large differences between the two results. And so it's important even for the vertical to consider if you're using a best, uh, if you're using compressible or incompressible model. And if you're looking at the horizontal velocities, it's interesting that they even point in different directions. For example, in the eastern, uh, southeastern part of Greenland, the velocities point towards uh, the Atlantic using a compressible model, while they point towards Greenland in an incompressible model. So completely different directions and magnitudes. And when we want to compare our, uh, our model results to observations, we definitely would see a big change. Yes, I have uh, shown you this uh, slide before, and um, the main aspect of my talk is wanted to highlight that we need GA models in various geoscientific fields, especially in geodesy, to correct our observations, for example, those that we also use as a constraint, of course. Um, but this requires availability of openly accessible model results, including uncertainties, and then 
we, you need to know the details about the input parameters. And this is what we as a GI community also have to work on our, ourselves, that we provide all the input parameters in detail and uncertainties so that uh, we make it easier for the users to use in the GA models. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? Ah, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you again for the presentation. Uh, are the questions uh, here in the room or probably somebody attending remotely? Um, so, uh, <laughs> we talk always about constant, constant movement. Um, there is any uh, talks about modeling accelerations in the GM models because the the ice is uh, melting strongly now and probably the vertical motion is not constant. But uh, taking... um, can you please come to the micro in front of the computer? I think this one works better. It's really difficult to understand the question. Now? Better? No? Now? Okay. Now? One? Yeah, maybe a bit better. Uh, okay, if, if you all have considered the possibility to model acceleration in the GIA motion, because they are always constant. Nice. Yes, I mean, um, the problem is that um, what is usually done is that we use an elastic model or use an, an elastic estimation of the um, more recent changes. And then the GA model gives us a viscoelastic. So at the end, it's even better to combine all this and have an, one model that runs from like 200,000 years ago until the future with then smaller time steps in the current time range. Yeah. Um, this would also give us an acceleration, but um, it's an it's an issue with the ta with the model um, domains um, because the elastic estimates are also on a much higher resolution scale and we are not able to or it's more difficult to combine it when we want, want to model it. Not only in time, also the spatial resolution is different and challenging. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other comment or question? If not. Uh, I thank you again for the nice presentation.